busy schedules to be here with more than 2,000 of your peers. That is double the number of attendees at this conference that over last year. You're joined in the room this morning by CFOs, heads of FP&A, controllers, finance transformation leaders from companies and government institutions, large and small. Now, before we get started with this morning's keynote, we're gonna take just a few minutes and look backwards at the year that we've had and also forward at the opportunities on the horizon. Let's start with an easy warm up this morning. What is one word that you would use to describe your role in the last 12 months? I asked several of you leading up to this event, a few more of you at the happy hours last night, and a couple more of you at breakfast this morning, and you told me things like dynamic, fluid, volatile, unrelenting, unachievable, expansive, complex. Some of you said weird <laughs> and unpredictable. Now, this is no surprise. We're in a different part of the economic cycle. We've been battling through higher rates, tighter credit, slowing demand. We've had to plan for a few recessions, I think, at this point. We've had to reforecast, rebudget as we learn more about inflation, the consumer, and demand for our products and services. We've had to drive efficiency across our businesses, challenging all teams to do more with less and be more productive. We've had to manage expenses tightly. We've had to renegotiate contracts. Who would have thought in the last 12 months we were worried about the health of our banking system? Right, we had to meet rising pay expectations. We had to deal with activist investors that are circling, assessing the diversity of our boards and the viability of our environmental sustainability programs. This is all while we were walking a tightrope with investors, managing expenses and profitability while painting a picture of the glorious opportunities that lie ahead. And this is all while we were battling our own burnout and the burnout of our teams. At the same time, we kept our foot on the accelerator. Most of us are still driving hard towards digital enterprise transformation. And in the finance function, we're still making strides towards autonomous finance. <clears throat> we're rebuilding our data architecture. We're applying advanced analytics. We're adding machine learning, robotics. But this is all in the last 12 months, right? And we as CFOs, we get paid to live 12 months in the future. In the next 12 months, we'll have to start preparing for yet another phase of the economic cycle where it's not only about cost control and profitability, but hopefully more growth and opportunities on the horizon. And there is a massive opportunity for all of us right around the corner. Do you realize that you are going to be in the driver's seat as CFO during the next industrial revolution? driven by generative artificial intelligence? Trying to see some of your faces. Think, let that sink in. Industrial revolutions are driven by large, broad, mainstream adoption of general purpose technologies. General purpose technologies like machinery, new energy sources, the steam engine, railways, automobiles, telecommunications, the internet. Generative artificial intelligence will mean we work differently, and it changes how, why, when, and where work is done in the knowledge economy. It's going to restack industries, and it's going to shake up leaders within those industries. Some are estimating that generative artificial intelligence could add upwards of 200 trillion to the global economy by 2030. And here's the deal, our employees are already back in the office experimenting with these tools today, except a few CFOs last night told me they've already banned it. Digital giants are releasing new applications week over week over week, and those things will be embedded directly into the workflows and processes that we manage. If they're not already, it will be before we know it. So as a CFO, it is time for you and your organization to reinvent, to recreate, to reallocate, and to reorganize. We have some time. We know this is on the horizon, it's moving quickly, and it's, but it's gonna be a large, long, massive transformation over many years and decades. But it's at this conference today that we start to have well-formed opinions 
for our organization. We need to understand what should our policies be? What are the risks? Is our data ready? Is our talent ready? Do we augment staff or replace staff? Which vendors should we be working with? What are the best use cases across our SGNA functions? And how do we tell the right balanced but opportunistic story to our staff, our organization, and our investors? Now, Gartner's gonna be right alongside you on this path. We're investing ahead of the curve so that you can stay two steps ahead on this industrial revolution. We're also rethinking our own client experience already in the face of generative artificial intelligence. And at this conference, we're gonna help you solidify your own opinions, learn best practices, benchmark your thinking, and partner with the right vendors and service providers to unlock growth in this new opportunity. Now at the conference, we're also gonna get super practical and super tactical with sessions related to our finance transformations. What are the skills we need? What are the org structures that winning companies are using? How do we deploy talent? What's on our technology roadmap? How do we think about ESG and diverse leadership? Just a few topics that we're excited to bring all of you today. Now as we get started with this conference, set a few goals for yourself. One goal is around the type of connections you want to make. Who do you want to meet and how are you going to stay connected? When you get into those roundtables, ask the tough questions, challenge each other, and show vulnerability. When you go to the vendor hall to meet with vendors, make sure you're meeting with new vendors that you haven't heard of. And the ones that you have heard of, ask them about their latest capabilities, maybe how they're deploying AI across their processes. And then finally, don't miss the Gartner Zone, which is right outside these doors. At the Gartner Zone, we are showing you how other clients are finding the most value out of their Gartner subscriptions. Now, we have one aim for you in the next 48 hours, these two days that you're gonna spend with us and your peers, and that is that you look back on Friday and you feel more ready for a CFO role that is expansive, unpredictable, fluid, dynamic, and unrelenting and that you can take renewed energy and confidence back to the teams that you lead and get ready for even more transformation on the horizon. To get us started on that journey, I'm now going to welcome to the stage VP analyst Dennis Gannon for this morning's keynote. Good morning. I am excited and honored to be kicking off what is going to be a fantastic couple of days here with some words in my title that might need a little bit of, of context or explanation. We're talking about the human CFO leading in the face of disruption. Now, the disruption side of that I think is really easy to get on board with, like everything Alex just said. 12 months ago, I don't think anybody in this room was thinking that generative AI would be doing your kids' homework for them, right? That it would be maybe uh, writing the first draft of your MDNA, maybe, or that uh, a headline like this, something that would have been the, the plot of a mediocre science fiction story 12 months ago. It's reality now with a gaming company installing an AI as their CEO earlier this year. Now, yeah, sure, it, it's, it's great publicity for that company and it's a great way to get your, your story to go viral for a day, but the changes being wrought here are very real. Technology is disrupting expectations, interactions, workflows like never before. And so to be sure, this conference is going to be all about harnessing technology to, to drive autonomous finance, harnessing digital and data to drive innovation and profitable growth. And yeah, if it's not already, you are soon going to have AI and ML executing large parts of what humans used to do at your organization. So why is the human CFO our topic here today? Why, why am I not up on stage talking about how we're gonna program the AI CFO to navigate these disruptions for us? Well, even though this environment is marked by all the ways in which technology is changing the game here, improving our people leadership is actually more important than ever. So let's talk for a minute about that. Talk about how these changes are impacting our employees and impacting what it means for us to be a leader. 
And then let's go a little deeper on what it means for us as CFOs. But let's start with the kind of the bigger picture here because lots of employees across all kinds of industries, all kinds of functional areas, they're feeling a, a new and unsettling relationship with technology. They're seeing these headlines about jobs that look like theirs now being taken by AI, about these jobs just disappearing to, to be done by machines. But as much as someone on your team might fear that advanced technology is coming to take their job away from them altogether, the picture that's actually emerging is a lot more complicated. In practice, what we're seeing is the emergence of a human machine learning loop, an ecosystem in which humans and machines are, are doing what they're best at and interacting with each other. So you have technology providing tripwires and, and trigger warnings and uh, formulating simple recommendations, cleaning and refining data. And then you have humans that are interpreting that data. They're formulating new goals, identifying new problems, uh, taking on more complex decisions and recommendations. It's, instead of having a, a technology replace a person, what we're seeing happen far more often is that the human and the machine are complementing each other and making, it be making each other better. Or at least that's the theory, right? This is what it looks like when it, when it goes right. But making it go right, it's not easy at all, actually. Think about how challenging this must be for someone on your team. For continuously changing their, their workflows and their routines that they've built around these tools to uh, the overwhelming feeling that they must have staring at this mountain of work that they have to do to, to keep the proverbial lights on. And then constantly being told that there's all kinds of new opportunities out there for us to innovate quicker, faster, right, and, and, and push harder. The human side of this learning loop, that's where the real risks are in our transformation efforts right now. If we can't keep our analytics team engaged and, and dialed in with all the change that we're throwing at them, if we can't retain that hotshot new head of uh, uh, artificial intelligence that we've got who's gonna develop our AI strategy for the organization, that's a much bigger risk than you know, a software pilot crashing and burning. Managing this human element is as critical as it has ever been. But I'm not up here today to just give you a reminder to pay attention to your leadership. I know how important this is for, for so many of you already. What's news here is how much this environment has changed what your people need from you as a leader. Now, my colleagues in our HR practice here at Gartner, they're experts in all things leadership, and they have absolutely caught on to this emerging relationship that, that people have with technology and the leadership gap that's emerging here. And at Gartner, we've written a lot in the last few months about the call to human leadership in today's world. Now, human leadership, it, it is fundamentally what it sounds like. It's corporate leadership uh, with a foundational human component to it. But as straightforward as that might sound, being human as a leader, it's actually not that easy. Most of us aren't getting there. You look across the executive suite, not just finance, but operations, you know, supply chain, IT, everywhere. Employees tell us that less than 25% of their leaders are meeting their expectations for human leadership. 25%, that's not good. So what are we missing? What's gone wrong here? Well, let's break it down because there are three core components of human leadership that we've identified here at Gartner. They're adaptivity, empathy, and authenticity. And let's take a minute and look at these three things and figure out where we're doing okay, but where it is that we have work to do to meet the expectation that our employees have of us. And let's start with adaptivity. And I think on this one, actually, um, this is kind of a good news story here. We all deserve some credit here. Our employees are now demanding a more customized, a more flexible work experience, and by and large, we've responded to that demand. Not just with hybrid. I know a lot of you are meeting the, the, the new expectations that your employees have about when and where they do their work, right, and accommodating their desire to you know, be at home for several days a week or to shift work around so they can do some things in the evening to be with their family in the afternoon, things like that. But it's not just when and where we're working. 
more and more of us are extending that radical flexibility to things like with whom I'm working and how much work I'm doing. I don't necessarily want to just be assigned into a relationship with a random coworker. I don't want to have to be kind of eight hours a day in this one place, day after day after day. I want more flexibility in that. Or even extending to what work I do. Recognize that, hey, as an employee, I'm going to be more engaged if I have the opportunity to protect my time for this thing and get after that. Now, the pandemic, the ensuing shutdown, it may have forced our hands here, to be sure. But you've continued to meet the bar in the years since and responding to the demands of your employees here. So, so credit to, to this group, actually, and this element of human leadership. Uh, honestly, good work. And, and there's more to be done here. Our, our mission isn't finished here by any means. But it does mean if adaptivity isn't the sticking point here, if that's not what we're falling down on, then it's the next two pillars where we really need to dial in. And let's start with empathy. What does it mean to lead with empathy? I think when we picture empathy as leaders, there's a good chance that a lot of us are getting it kind of wrong. Because empathy isn't just being nice. It's not just saying kind words to somebody. The most productive way to think about empathy is as a cognitive process. Right? It's not an inherent trait, something we're either born with or not, but it's more like an exercise that we can choose to do or, or not do. And sure, the, the baseline conception of choosing to, to bring some kindness to an interaction, that could be a good starting point on this journey. But true empathetic leadership requires more. Past the articulation of kindness into taking the time to cultivate a deliberate understanding of the motivations, the experiences of someone else and leaving your own biases behind while you do that. And then building on that, turning that understanding into intentional action, right? actually creating change, engineering our workflows based on that empathetic understanding that we've built. This is a critical mandate for us. Over 80% of the HR leaders that we work with at Gartner, they're telling us that the emerging Generation Z workforce They've got a higher bar for empathy, for emotionally intelligent leadership at work. And then authenticity. Think about how there's no more hard and fast line between who you are at home and, and who you are at work. That, that boundary has been obliterated, right? It is routine now that you're having a catch up with one of your employees, one of your team members in their bedroom. Think about that, that's weird. It's not unusual that someone's child or their dog becomes a new participant in your one-on-one -on -one that day, right? That's normal, and it's raised the bar for authenticity in our leadership at work. And you might be thinking, yeah, no, I, I get this. I've been, I've been reading the books and, and thinking about this. I've been doing these town halls, these Ask Me Anythings where I'm super transparent about what's going on. Um, I actually did this feature on our corporate intranet last week, a get to know your leadership team. They came and took some pictures of my house, my family, and all that. And sure, that, that's not wrong, per se. Um, that kind of sharing isn't bad, but it's not sufficient for true human leadership, right? Just like we saw with empathy, sort of a spectrum of approaches we can use to organize our thinking here. And authentic human leadership requires more than personal sharing. It requires also a level of personal candor that we bring to our interactions, honesty and transparency that sets a tone for others to do the same. It requires us to be genuinely vulnerable in front of our, our boss, our, our teams, our, our peers, to show people that they can take a personal risk, they can put themselves out there and not be punished by the system for doing so, which is, by the way, not the case right now. Over half of your teams, over half of finance employees are telling us they are afraid to take a calculated risk on behalf of the organization because they're afraid it's gonna blow back on them. So we need to challenge ourselves to raise the bar here for what it means to lead with authenticity. Think about this maybe in terms of how you might, uh, how you might share some details about a vacation that you took, right? Maybe you uh, put a social media post out there with a picture of, of you and your family and you're dressed beautifully and you're all getting along and you're smiling and you're sitting in front of this beautiful oceanside view, right? Yeah, sure, maybe that's some kind of, of sharing, but true authenticity would be the candor in letting people see just how stressed it made you to kind of keep your kids contained and occupied on the seven hours worth of flights that it took to get there or, 
or the vulnerability in letting people know that when it came time to, uh, to take that step off the bungee jump platform, you, you got a little nervous. You started to second guess the decisions in life that, that led you to that point. Right? When you role model what it means to be authentic in this way, you empower your teams to be their authentic selves. And the payoff here for nailing this, it's incredible. If we lead our teams with adaptivity, empathy, and authenticity, well, for one thing, that turnover and attrition that we're always dealing with, the average human leader improves intention to stay by a full 12 points over the average leader. And that burnout that we're always seeming to feel on our teams and trying to get ahead of, the, the pervasive wariness that we can sense sometimes, human leaders improve well-being by a full 30 points compared to their peers. And that disconnection that we see where folks are turning off their cameras and they're kind of dialing back and, and they're just doing kind of the minimum that it takes to get by for a while, human leadership drives up engagement by 37 points. That is incredible. That, this is why human leadership is the playbook for this kind of environment of disruption. Because this payoff is amazing. Intention to stay, well-being, engagement. We know we need these things. We know how much value those things drive, how much it improves team performance. But you might be sitting there right now thinking, OK, Dennis, I'm with you. I buy this. I like everything I've heard. But it kind of sounds like something that everybody needs to be doing, not just me, but it sounds like something for my CIO, for my head of marketing, for our GMs, right? This seems like a good thing for, for everybody. So you know, when you tell me that we're talking about the human CFO, yeah, the human part of that makes sense now. But what about the CFO part? Because as a, a finance leader, we have some unique responsibilities. We have to be the last line of defense in protecting the financial outcomes that determine whether the organization gets to keep growing, whether there are new opportunities for people, and whether we get to live in that world of expanding opportunities and horizons, or whether we go the other way and things start to shrink and we lose opportunities for folks. That's why the organization has a CFO. It's not just signing off on the books after everything has happened. It is making those hard decisions, the tough economic trade-offs that protect the growth and profitability of the organization, the, the outcomes that are so foundational to everything else that we're trying to do. And that need to make hard trade-offs, to protect financial discipline, having that as job one for you as a finance leader, that can make my entire call to human leadership that I've sounded here so far make it feel maybe a little remote from some of the hard questions of your job. In fact, it feels like what the enterprise is demanding of you especially, again, in this tough economic environment that we're in, is something very different than human leadership. And so we've been telling us, in fact, over these last six months, as we've been doing research into how CFOs have been responding to these changing economic conditions and the unpredictability that we've all been experiencing, and you've been telling us that even though your CFO role, it continues to expand and evolve in all kinds of interesting and unpredictable ways, you're leaning more than ever into supply chain, operations, uh, corporate strategy, enterprise digital transformation, right? all these things. But you tell us that collectively, amidst all this, your number one mission is still about enforcing financial discipline. You told us that in this environment right now, it is critical more than ever for finance to provide things like, like scrutiny. Right? When our, our teams are stretched thin, cost of capital is high, Funding is, is scarce. We need to make sure we're not just throwing money at bad ideas, right? So we're raising the level of scrutiny that we bring to business cases. We're pushing harder on assumptions. We are looking at new spending requests with more uh, acute attention. And we know a lot of new bets that we're making may not pay off. So we're looking for more and better data to tell us if an investment is working, trying to find the good leading indicators that give us insight or, or the right metrics to, to put on a dashboard. And then more accountability, dialing up business leader and project sponsor accountability for the ROI that they promised us, putting their, their feet to the fire. Now, say what you want about this list and how necessary you might think it is to run this playbook, but scrutiny, data, accountability, 
this doesn't feel like humanity, right? You don't see a lot of empathy and authenticity emerging from this list, right? I mean, your, your business certainly doesn't. They tell us that, that your focus on financial discipline is alienating to them. And, and I know this because at Gartner, we run an exercise where we capture, quantify, and structure the, the, the feedback that you get from your business partners on the service that finance is providing to your stakeholders in the broader organization. And in this exercise, your stakeholders are telling us loud and clear that they're not feeling the human leadership from you. They tell us things like, finance is stifling innovation. They're creating a burden for my department. One CFO candidly remarked to me that his team had become known as the Office of Business Prevention. <laughs> Look, financial discipline is necessary, and I like standing in front of CFOs and talking to them, so I am never going to stand up here and tell you to take your eye off of that ball. But financial discipline being necessary doesn't mean it has to be alienating. It doesn't have to compete with human leadership for our focus. In fact, stewarding financial discipline can still be a human mission at heart. And maybe the single most important thing I can ask you to take away from the time we have together today is this, that when we do it right, the mission of driving financial discipline is one and the same as the mission of being a human leader. Being a human CFO means that the impact of our empathy and our authenticity, it shows up not just in the quality of interactions we're having, not just in the feedback that we get from our team on our managerial performance, it shows up in improving our ability to make those tough economic trade-offs to protect financial outcomes for the entire enterprise. It means that the human CFO is a better CFO. That's a bold statement, but it's what I want you approaching the rest of the conference with because this assertion that the human CFO is a better CFO it's not just some one-off assertion that we derive for, for this morning's session. This imperative, it's grounded in some of the most important work that we've been doing for you across the last few years. Research that importantly didn't start off on how to be a human CFO. It started off on questions like, how do we grow efficiently? How do we expand our top line while also driving bottom line efficiency improvements simultaneously? Or research on the right strategies to allocate capital in this environment to get full value from our digital investing portfolios. Or research on how to optimize cost and generate sustainable profitability. What kept emerging in all this research on questions of financial performance are unexpected but very real themes of a human CFO at work, of CFOs accessing their empathy and their authenticity to drive enterprise outcomes. So let's take the remaining time that we have together and let's look at some of these examples where the answer is all about being a human CFO. Share some human examples of what it means to lead with empathy and authenticity in your CFO job. And let's start with empathy as a CFO. Uh, remember, when we're talking about empathy here, we're not just talking about how to be nice, how to be kind, right? That's a, a reasonable entry point to exercising empathy, but how do we take it up a step? and exercise a more deliberate understanding of what matters to others, and then critically, use that understanding to make us a better CFO. Well, let's start here. It's probably not a surprise to, to most folks in the room here that CFOs who drive corporate performance have a strong CEO relationship. That's a powerful predictor. But the nature of that relationship is what matters here. The most effective performance driving CFOs are able to challenge their CEOs, and not just challenge them on the financial implications of a choice that they've made, but actually challenge them on some of the fundamental strategic options that they're dealing with. And you know, people don't like being challenged, right? They don't like having their beliefs questioned. There's great research out there in the field of psychology on how we defend our strongly held beliefs in the face of countervailing evidence, how we stick to a decision that we made much longer than, than we should. So I was struck by how one CFO that we work with, he used empathy to better challenge his CEO by working through a big deliberate role play exercise with them. Um, he said, when they're faced with a major strategic decision, 
They take a 30-minute meeting where they intentionally switch chairs. They, they attack the problem from each other's perspective. The CFO is forced to think about and articulate, if I were the CEO here, with all those stakeholders and all those pressures on me, what would I do? And the CEO is forced to articulate things from a CFO perspective and try to spell out what they would do with that hat on. And then with about you know, five minutes left to go, they go back to their original chairs and they, they talk about what it is that they've learned here. And the CFO made it a point to mention to us several critical decision points that their organization had reached where, where this deliberate understanding that they worked to build, it changed not only the answers that the CEO was naturally inclined to run towards, but it changed the very nature of the questions that they were asking to begin with. It's a great exercise in building empathy deliberately and getting to a better business outcome for it. And the farther we go on the spectrum, the more we start to generate intentional action and more we start to engineer work and create change in a way that's informed by that understanding that we've worked to create. Like the, a CFO that we work with uh, at, at a diversified industrial, uh, she recognized that the cadence of their monthly operating reviews that finance was leading it wasn't yielding anything productive. Um, she talked about how it was always this defensive posture. It felt like debates about the numbers themselves rather than about what they meant. Maybe that sounds familiar, right? It was always a, uh, an interrogation more than, more than was intended to be. And, and this, instead of attacking this head on with single version of the truth data and more authoritative analysis to kind of quiet dissent at the beginning of these sessions, this CFO I think was very clever. And she looked at it from a human perspective with empathy. And, and played out the fact that she was essentially forcing her partners in the business to be defensive here. By, by leading with the financial review and a review of results, you're making them defend their decisions. You're making them justify choices that they made, right? defend their performance. And so instead, what the CFO did, she kind of flipped things. She, she moved the financial review, the, the whole reason we're having this meeting, the, the, the very thing that, that it is that got us together here, she moved that to the very end of the agenda and instead started with the stuff that was more top of mind, more relevant, more, uh, more urgent for her partners in the business on the other side of the table. Things like uh, you know, how is the market changing? What's, what's keeping you up at night? How is the customer changing? What new risks and opportunities are you seeing emerging? And so on. It's a, it's a much less threatening conversation. It's, it's way more empathetic of a CFO to to lead it this way. But what's great here, the best part about it is, the CFO talked to us about how she still gets all the information she needs, in fact, even more useful information and detail than ever before, in this more empathetically grounded discussion. She told us that by the time that you get to that financial review item on agenda item seven and at the end of the, the, the two hours that we're spending together, there's nothing left to say. All the important information that she needs as a CFO about what's happening and why has come out in a much more empathetically grounded way. And I think this is what empathy can really look like for you as a CFO, using that emotionally intelligent leadership to drive better business results. So think about those places where there's a gap in understanding between business and the finance, places where you are forcing compliance instead of enabling cooperation and challenge yourself to tap into empathetic leadership as your solution here by cultivating a deliberate understanding of what matters to stakeholders outside of yourself and taking intentional action to create processes and situations that are built on that understanding. Okay, let me round out the picture here by talking about authenticity and how we've seen that make you a more effective CFO. Now remember here, authenticity, it's not metering out strategic snapshots, right? It's not the, uh, the carefully crafted and curated social media post. Uh, it's putting your true self out there. It's raising the bar for candor and vulnerability in our interactions. And let's start with candor and what that means for us as a, uh, as a CFO. Because there's a sense in which I bet a lot of us think we have candor nailed as part of our job. Right, you know, I'm the CFO, I'm the one who brings an unambiguous data-driven perspective. I cut through the clutter, right, with the, the data-grounded uh, perspective that I bring. But authentic candor, it's more than straight talk. It's more than telling it like it is. Authentic candor is reciprocal. It enables candor from others. And that candor from others, that's really what you need 
as a CFO, because at the risk of shocking here, I'm gonna tell you, people don't always tell the CFO everything they're thinking. Everything that comes to you, it's been dressed up, it's got his best Sunday suit on, its hair has been combed, it looks really nice before you see it, right? And we need to use candor to cut through that. Like one CFO we work with, uh, an energy company, uh, who we identified as a leader in efficient growth outcomes. He actually told his business leaders and his executive team, he literally said this, he said, look, it seems like once I tell you that I'm going to apply a hurdle rate to your proposals and do an NPV as part of that evaluation process, feels like it's all over at that point because you're only gonna bring me things that meet those criteria. It becomes all about dressing up your numbers to make sure they get over that hurdle and into the next stage of approval. And that becomes the entire game. So rather than continuing that back and forth numbers game, what the CFO did, he, he broke that dynamic by leaning into candor. And he said, okay, listen, we're gonna stop doing MPVs. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop looking at your projects that way. Uh, they're getting in the way of a real and honest conversation about what we wanna do and why. And so instead, we're gonna have a conversation that doesn't bury all the specific details of your project under a one-size-fits-all hurdle rate. We're gonna dig in, we're gonna have a, a conversation about all the operating, strategic, market, customer dimensions of your project. We're gonna talk about you know, what kind of tech does it require? How, how complex is it? Has it left the laboratory yet? Uh, what's the scope of this like? Is it bigger than the things we've usually done? Smaller than the things we've done? What kinds of execution risks are lurking here? And the full candor is supported in this conversation because at the end of it all, what the CFO does is actually publish a list for the entire organization of the initiatives that they're funding and why. So really being transparent about the fact that Hey, guess what project sponsors? The, the straight NPV, the straight numbers of one of these things that we're choosing to do might not have been as strong as the NPV of something else that we we're looking at, but it was still the right thing to do anyway. Right? And that candor cuts right through the noise of the numbers game there. And it's enabled them to build a, a growth portfolio that is balanced and, and achievable and not just the results of, uh, of projections on paper. So, Take this one as another call to action for you, personally. Think to yourself, how can I explicitly role model the kind of candor that inspires candor from others? How can I remove some of the trappings of my authority, some of the processes that I'm tasked with enforcing? I mean, maybe you get rid of NPVs and hurdle rates, maybe, maybe not, right? But how do I shed some of those things to create a more naturally candid conversation with my stakeholders? Now, the more aspirational point on this spectrum is vulnerability. And uh, saying to this room that vulnerability is aspirational, kind of like some of the other things maybe I've said so far today, it could be a little bit of a tough sell, right? Because uh, people look to you as a CFO for, for answers, for comfort. And when, when you walk into a room, there's more than one person who thinks to themselves, okay, well, there's the person who knows what's going on. They, they've got the real answers, the real data. We'll hear what they have to say. Now, this pressure uh, to, to have the answers, to be relied upon, to be steady, that, that is very real. It's very much a part of your job. So why am I talking about vulnerability here? The answer is much like what we saw with candor. If we don't authentically role model and enable vulnerability in our leadership, we're not going to get it from others. And in an environment where over half your team is afraid to take a calculated risk for the organization, we have to enable that vulnerability. We have to create the space that allows someone to say, hey, I messed this up, actually. This, this project really isn't going that well. We're having a hard time getting the kind of talent that we need hired on time, and, and I'm worried about the ramp up. Or I might have been too aggressive. No, check that, I definitely was way too aggressive in my forecast. Uh, but I feel like I'm locked into it and I'm gonna defend it until month 12 because who knows, something might happen. I don't wanna go through everything that comes with forecasting down. Right? Uh, or this yes, funding, I actually uh, didn't really need it this year, but I thought I was gonna need it next year and I thought if I didn't ask for it this year, it wasn't gonna be there for me next year. Right? You need to hear things like this because people out there are thinking them, but I'm betting you don't hear it very often. People feel like the system is set up to punish them for bringing it forward. So I wanna challenge you right now. Think about the last time you said something of the form, hey, I really wish I had done that better. Here's what I learned from that. Here's what I need to do better next time. 
might be hard to come up with one. That's why I think it's a good challenge for us to, to signal our own vulnerability, to, to, to let the team know that, hey, you know what, I actually don't have a fully well thought out theory of how generative AI is going to change what it is that our customers are, are looking for from us. Or you know, whatever it is that you don't have a great answer on, wherever it is that you're trying to learn from your own shortcomings. Remember, this is not about expressing concern for what other people are doing. This is about signaling that you don't have all the answers. And that's an okay way to be, because it's much better than pretending we have the answers when we don't. So let's ask ourselves, how can I develop my personal candor to enable candor from others on things like project, upside and downside, ways we could be doing things better? And how do I role model that personal vulnerability in my job as a leader here so that someone is more willing to do something that might represent a personal risk for them, but is good for the outcomes that we're all trying to drive as an enterprise? Now, okay, I think these are hopefully some good examples of what it looks like when we bring empathy and authenticity as a human CFO. And this human playbook for driving financial discipline, it's only gonna get more and more important in the years ahead because right now, our digital investing portfolios are growing rapidly. IT spending is more foundational to everything we're doing in our business than ever before. And yet, from a human perspective, the state of the CFO-CIO partnership is not great. It's usually arm's length, it's polite, it's not antagonistic usually, but it's not grounded in empathy and authenticity. And, and I get it, CFOs and CIOs are they're cut from different claws, so we, we tend to live in different worlds. But the upshot is only three out of every 10 of us in this room here have an effective relationship with our technology leaders. So let's give ourselves kind of a quick check in here. Uh, this might be a good chance for you to internalize some opportunities for you to lean into being a human CFO. Ask yourself, do I have the reciprocal candor that creates transparency into each other's priorities with my CIO? In other words, do you know, can you rattle off right now your CIO's objectives and how they're tracking towards them? And what role you as a finance leader play in them? Can they do the same for you? Are you present at the IT road mapping process? Not as the owner of finance's piece of that pie, but as a true partner to your CIO, taking advantage of an incredibly leveraged opportunity to cultivate some deliberate empathy with each other. And are you explicitly role modeling cooperation with your CIO? One CFO that we work with makes sure of this. He co-leads town halls with his CIO. They jointly issue statements about enterprise digital strategy with both their names, both their pictures on it. They stand up and advocate for each other's priorities in, in leadership meetings, the kind of things that you just don't see that often from these two executives. So if you're three for three on this list, if you said, yep, 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 that's, that's awesome. That's great news. That is real markers of human CFO at work for you. A lot to build on there. Insofar as you left some opportunity on the table there, it's a great thing to get after. Because when the CFO and CIO have that kind of relationship, we see that the organization is significantly more likely to deliver the intended outcomes from their business portfolio. And they're significantly more likely to keep spending in line with the budget. All right, this is the financial discipline that we want as CFOs. And it's by being a human CFO that we get it. So that's our mission going forward here. Let's ask ourselves, walking out of here, how can I be a human CFO that drives better financial discipline through empathy and authenticity? Because in the months ahead, you're gonna be making hard trade-offs about where you can afford to invest and, and where you can't. You're gonna be sitting in business reviews where performance is choppy and uncertain. You're gonna be trying to drive folks back to plan. You're gonna be sitting in executive meetings with real strategic decisions in front of you. And as you navigate those, those core CFO job responsibilities, I'm challenging all of us here to look at human leadership not as a part-time job, not as the thing that we do when we're running team meetings or, or having one-on-ones, but as our path to greater financial discipline, as our path to being a, a better, more effective finance leader. I know that you're gonna learn so much in these next two days. You're, you're gonna meet a lot of amazing people. You're gonna hear from some of the smartest people in the world on things like 
building use cases for AI and finance or delivering real-time analytics to your business. And as you do that, I want you to keep your role as human CFO front and center here, knowing that as technology continues to disrupt everything we know about our lives, it's only accelerating the trend for us to bring cognitive empathy and personal authenticity to the enterprise outcomes at the heart of our CFO role. Let's, let's go out there, let's meet some people, let's learn some things, let's have a lot of fun, let's go make it a great conference. Thank you all so much. Stumbling